got Triple B's in the building. Big Baller brand supports the NBA buzz and the inside buzz. We with you, man. Triple B style. Hi, and welcome back to Inside Buzz. I'm your host, Mikey Domagala. For episode 28, welcome in 10-time NBA veteran C.J. Watson, an undrafted point guard who spent 10 years in the NBA for Golden State, Chicago, Brooklyn, Indiana, and Orlando. He averaged 10 points per game four times in his 10-year career, including being a key player off the bench in numerous playoff runs in Chicago and Indiana in the early to mid-2010s. He last played for the Orlando Magic in 2017 before joining Ice Cube's Big Three, where he played for Killer Threes, of course being teammates with Josh Powell, a former friend of the show. He's also a children's book author, where he released three books called CJ's Big Dream, CJ's Big Project, and CJ's Big Moment, where he explains his growth from being a kid and all the way up to his basketball career in the NBA, inspiring the youth of his ups and downs to get to where he was at. CJ Watson, welcome to episode 28 of Inside Buzz. It's a pleasure having you. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. So, CJ, you've had a lot of former teammates who are in the playoffs this season. Derrick Rose, Paul George, George Hill, Aaron Gordon, Taj Gibson, Jimmy Butler, so many different players. What's it like seeing your former teammates, some you saw when they were rookies, now evolving into stars on the biggest stage? It's fun, man. It's good to see in the, the growth and the process of, of players, you know, the evolution of players. Uh especially just for someone just take Steph Curry, for example, but just see him come in as a rookie and to see his progression to the league, his uh, ups and downs that he had. And then, you know, eventually, you know, changing the game and coming probably, you know, if not the best shooter that the game's ever seen. So it's definitely fun to watch a former teammates play. I'm always rooting for him and uh, definitely love watching him play and watch him compete out there. Another thing I want to ask you, you've been on a lot of winning teams. You've been on deep playoff runs. This Los Angeles Lakers team, first round matchup against the Phoenix Suns do you see them going all the way this year um I don't know I mean you know LeBron's still banged up uh AD you know is still uh probably a little banged up also but I think it's still possible um they're they're still my, one of my favorites to win it all I think even with the you know 80 percent LeBron James he's still you know better off you know than, than most players in the NBA so it's definitely uh gonna be fun to see but I, I definitely think they still have the the wherewithal to to make all the way to the finals again so that being said about the Lakers and your thoughts on that, who do you see winning it all and meeting up in the finals? Uh, I like the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, I think they got a lot of firepower out there having three, you know, superstar studded players like KD, Kyrie and, and James. Um, and then, you know, adding Blake Griffin out there uh, it just gives them an extra boost. And they got shooters all around Joe Harris, Jeff Green. And um, I think they're, they're going to be one of the top favorites coming in the East or, you know, or the Bucks. Uh, they, they're still, uh, one of those top teams out there who, who added Drew Holiday, another piece, and uh, Chris Middleton's playing well this year. So I think those two teams are, are kind of my favorites, and I would love to see them one of them match up against the Lakers. Coming out of college, you know, undrafted, you played a year or two overseas. Then you get to the Golden State Warriors in 2007. That's right around in that we believe era of that team. Now, there's those guys like Baron Davis, Matt Barnes, Al Harrington, Steven Jackson, Chris Webber. All veteran guys, big stars. What was it like being a kid playing along those guys? It was fun, man. Those guys taught me a lot. They were my, uh, you know, typical OGs, as you would call it, in the NBA. They taught me a lot. They took me around with them. They always uh, had me under their wing, teach me about basketball on and off the court. And uh, it, was, it was definitely fun just to see those players that I always looked up to, especially Baron Davis. He was always something I looked up to, played video games with, and uh, just admired his game from afar. And then playing with players like Monte Ellis, you know, Steven Jackson, Al Harrington, all those guys help help me, you know, see the game from a different view. And then, you know, going out there and executing on the court and seeing them come in early, staying late at nights just uh, gave me the, the, the mental capacity to do the same thing they were doing to be successful in the league. And of course, there's many, many crazy stories that came out around that time and also came out later, which they said on all the smoke and whatnot. How true was it that Stack, Barnes, Harrington used to smoke marijuana before the games and even sometimes be drunk for the games. If you don't want to snitch or anything, it's all good. But some of those crazy stories, I want to get your thoughts on. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know if I was there for any of those stories. <laughs> I'll let them tell it. But uh, it was definitely, you know, fun to, to be with those guys and hang out with them. Uh, I learned them. I learned a lot of stuff to do and what not to do also. <laughs> so just put it like that. But uh, it's definitely fun hanging out with them and being around them. <laughs> that's a that's a perfect answer, to be honest. Um, 
also in Golden State, career career high 40 points on Sacramento in 2010. What was clicking that game? I mean, it looked like you were just shooting into the ocean. Everything was just going in. I think it was just a combination of, of hard work, you know, putting in the, the work on the off the court, um, coming in early, uh, staying late at night, uh, and getting all my work in uh, during shoot arounds and, and stuff like that. So uh, just working on things that Coach Nelson wanted me to work on, finishing at the rim, uh, being able to shoot the three ball, um, and just being able to get to the basket and get a layup for myself or, or, or my teammates. So I think it was just a combination of just um, doing all those things and building confidence over time. I think that was my third year. So I think the confidence started to click for me. And I started to see that, you know, I can really be good in this league and be successful, you know, and try to make a career out of this. A couple years ago, I mean, that whole Conor McGregor situation, whole Floyd Mayweather thing, you know, that's that's all out there. People know about it. If you don't, you could look it up. It's all nonsense, in my opinion. But when you saw Conor McGregor donning your jersey to kind of throw a diss at, at Floyd Mayweather, what were your initial thoughts about that? I didn't know whose jersey he had on. I mean, obviously at the time that was the number I was wearing, but I thought it was like kind of, you know, kind of a low ball, uh, um, I guess, gesture or whatever. But, you know, it's all entertainment for those guys. Those, they're entertainers also. They're trying to, you know, sell a fight and, and get more viewers and all that kind of stuff. But uh, some things I feel like you got to, you know, leave alone, and, and especially if you don't know, you know, all the all the details to, to whatever happened. So I think it was, you know, kind of low ball gesture. But, you know, it is what it is. It's all entertainment for those guys, like I said, and they're doing – certain things to sell a fight and promote a fight <clears throat> yeah and he, and uh i remember draymond green in the comments was like that's not my jersey it's not me all that all that craziness around that time just funny stuff um you you touched on baron davis before what else did baron teach you and how was he just in in that time where you were with him i mean he was a star in those days yeah for sure he just taught me how to network uh how to be professional off the court uh, and business savvy. Uh, he's a great business mind and a great business guy. He invests in a lot of things. So just uh, teaching me about investing and, and how to talk to certain people and, and how to, you know, raise money and things of that nature. Uh, he's definitely, you know, one of the mentors that I have and off the court and on the court. But he's definitely someone I can always call on, to, you know, to ask for his advice and he, he always pick up an answer. Yeah, he's in a lot of business ventures, I think, right? I see him on social media promoting a lot of stuff. Have have yeah. you gone into business with him on certain things? Yeah, yeah we've done a, a project uh, called UNEST. Uh, it's a savings program for kids. Uh, so it's definitely, I think it's going to be big and it's definitely, you know, a good good business model just to save money for your kids, to help them, you know, for the future and save for cars or, or books and tuition, stuff like that. So they're prepared for the future. Awesome. Everybody listening, go check that out. Support my guy, CJ. Also... In Golden State, you mentioned again before, a young Stephen Curry. Now, be honest with me. Did you see Stephen Curry becoming one of the greatest shooters, if not the greatest shooter of all time, and multi, you know, multi-time MVP from where you saw him as a rookie? I always get asked that question. It's crazy because, I mean, uh, obviously you see the, you know, the the highlights and the bright spots. But, uh, I mean, if you would ask me then if he would have been a superstar, I would have said, I don't know. But... Uh, definitely, he you know obviously had the genes from his dad playing in the NBA, and he saw what it took to be successful in this league. And uh, you seen him putting uh, the early mornings, the late nights, and then you saw it saw it on the court. He uh, made flashes his his first year, his rookie season, and uh, throughout the throughout that time, he kept getting better and better. He had to deal with some ankle injuries, but he overcame those. And like I said, he changed the game of basketball for as we know it. You know, for little kids shooting threes like Steph all the time, and and uh, draining 30, 35 foot shots, you know, and hitting you know, 10 or 11 three-pointers in a game. So he definitely changed the game, and he's definitely going to be a person that we mentioned, you know, from years and years to come that actually, you know, had an imprint on this game of basketball. The difference in the NBA from 10, 15 years ago and now the Curry era of three-point shooting, is it good for the game or is it not good for the game? I think it's great for the game. The game is always going to change and evolve, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years down the line we'll be back to, you know, like two bigs on the court, uh, you know, in big lineups, all that kind of stuff. But it's definitely changed and I think it's better for the fans. The fans want to see a faster game. Uh, they want to see more threes, higher scoring games, all that kind of stuff. So I think I think it's great for the game. And another guy, CJ, I'm sure you already know, I'm going to bring him up, Derrick Rose as a rookie. I mean, a couple 50-win seasons you were a part of in Chicago, helping him get to that. Uh, D. Rose's MVP season you saw. John Lucas III in a recent interview with Gilbert Arena said, people would get the Rose flu not to face him do you yeah. did you get any sense of that and man how great was prime derrick rose 
Yeah, so that was that was actually true. That's the first time when I've, I think I've been in the league three three or four years before that. And when we when I when I signed with Chicago, I've never seen players you know like run from other players or not want to guard certain players. Or, but like Lucas said, you know, having the flu and supposedly sick because they don't want to guard D Rose that night. But it definitely happened. Uh, he was playing at an unbelievable clip that year. His speed, his uh, his energy, his uh, strength, getting to the basket, dunking on people, and uh, I think he just you know gained the confidence throughout those first couple of seasons and seeing that, you know, he can be successful in this league and eventually be an MVP. And, and that's what he did. And obviously we fell short, you know, of the ultimate goal, which was the championship, but D Rose balled out that year and, uh, and it would always go down the books because of that. Everybody saw D Rose's, you know, big time dunks. I saw 10 years ago yesterday was D Rose's dunk fest on uh, the Miami right. heat where, he, where he dunked over, uh, Joel Anthony and that game, which was insane. Was there something that the the public didn't see where he did something amazing in practice that you could recall? No, not really, because really, I, don't, I don't even know if I ever seen him dunk in practice, actually, because all we did was play like, you know, one on one, two on two, three on three. We barely really played five on five, but I never really seen him dunk in practice. I seen I was amazed and, you know, in awe, just like the fans were watching it because I never really seen it in in uh, in uh, in practice. But he definitely put on a show. He was dunking on people left and right. Uh, you know, splitting the pick and rolls and dunking on people. And uh, it was just crazy. It was it was cool to watch. Of course. And I'm a big New York Knicks fan, so it's a pleasure to have him in New York. I'd love yeah. to get your thoughts on D. Rose now. What did you see then? What do you see now? Of course, he's more of a calculated killer now with his mid-range yeah. and all that. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. I think he's just a smarter player now. I think back then uh, he wasn't, wasn't reckless, I don't think, but he was just, you know, playing at his speed he was still change speeds uh pretty well uh but now you know it's kind of more uh calculated like you said he picks and chooses his spots he gets his teammates involved uh, a little more uh, he shoots the three ball uh, uh pretty well also i think he shoots like 40 percent this year or whatever but uh and he's uh being more of a leader also he's out there talking more and when i play with d rose me and me and him are both you know quiet shy guys but uh, he never hardly really talked but now he's talking more being more of a leader more of a mentor and i love to see it yeah, that's the biggest thing I've I've noticed. He's like yelling on the court and kind of talking yeah, yeah. smack to players. He I didn't yeah, see that yeah. at all back then. The yeah, yeah, exactly. He was just call, <laughs> he was just calling out Trey Young. I just posted that before this, and I'm excited for game two tonight. Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, and another guy in New York, Tom Thibodeau, your former coach. Now, when you see the turnaround that he brought to New York this season, were your thoughts? Oh man, that's the same old Tibbs. You already know he's gonna come in and change the culture, or is he different from when you were with him? Uh, I'm sure he's probably different now. Um, maybe uh, you know, lighter practices and, and things of that nature. But I definitely knew once they signed him that New York was gonna be back rocking. They're gonna be back, you know, in that playoff contention. And maybe uh, they're probably maybe like you know one or two uh, players, and then maybe like a, a bench player short from you know being in that uh, championship contention always talking about them, but I think they're definitely close. Uh, hopefully they get out of, out of this round and keep uh, advancing, but uh, I think they're definitely on the brink of, you know, something great. And New York's going to be, you know, back rocking like they used to be. In your career, you had coaches like Don Nelson, obviously the legendary coach, also Thibodeau, a couple other great coaches. How does Thib stand out from the other coaches you've played under? Well, number one, Thib doesn't have a life. Uh, all he does is, is, is uh, uh, do basketball, eat basketball, look at basketball. So I think uh, he's very focused on that. Not to say the other ones weren't, but Tibbs is a hundred percent basketball 24 seven. And he always has his teams prepared. He uh, makes sure that we know every play uh, that the teams are going to run all the tendencies of the players, uh, the pros and cons and uh, all that kind of stuff. So Tibbs, uh, it definitely has a team prepared and it's really up to the players to go out there and execute his game plan. It's funny during your career, you were in that stage where today in 2020, these stars now were like all rookies or young players. Another guy in Chicago, Jimmy Butler, he just averaged yeah. two points a game when you were teammates yeah. with him. Did you expect? Yeah. Did you expect him to become what he is today? I knew once you know when Jimmy got his shot, he would definitely go out there and perform and do well. Uh, like I said, I never seen him play the two years that I was there. Um, he never really seen the court. It was hard to uh, get him on the court with guys like Ronnie Brewer and Kyle Korver, and uh, Tibbs wasn't really you know fond of, of playing rookies, so. Uh, definitely, I seen Jimmy, you know, before practice, after practice, running suicides, you know, getting extra shots up uh, if he wasn't practicing. So you definitely seen the hard work that he was putting in and knew one day whenever he got his shot that he would make it make it worth it. 
I'm going to give you a true or false here, CJ. True or false, if Derrick Rose didn't tear his ACL in 2012, Chicago would have won a championship over the next three seasons after that. True, for sure. And and why so? You think Derrick Rose would have really became more so of a player? Uh, I think it was just a, kind of a whole team mental thing. I think once we all saw that D Rose went down, obviously you know it, it sucks, it hurts, but you know he was our he was our team leader, he was our MVP, and we kind of uh, knew that and relied on him. And uh, it kind of just I think it just took us all for you know a toll. Like when one of your star players gets 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 hurt like that, and you know they're not going to come back. And you had a great team around him and. Joakim Noah, yeah. you know, Booz, Kyle Korver, yeah. Butler coming into his own, all, all those guys. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I see it. I agree with you. We touched on Curry. We touched on Rose. Another star point guard you play with, Darren Williams. In my opinion, one of the most underrated point guards of the last 10 seasons. How is playing with him different from Curry and, and D. Rose? I didn't play with him and, you know, when he was younger. Uh, D. Will was kind of like, not, not older, but uh, on that older scale. Still in his prime, but uh, he was still an all-star, still. Uh, the same D will that you saw in Utah, um, and uh, I always thought D will is one of those players, point guards that was tough to guard because he can shoot. He's big and strong. He's physical. He'll take you outside, he'll take you on the post. So D will is a, that complete point guard. You know that you were worried about seeing every night. <laughs> For sure. And I specifically remember watching you ball in the 2014 playoffs with Indiana. How was it being on the biggest stage and balling really against the Miami's big three, that stacked Hawks team, and you just getting buckets, and of and of it's course, fun. of course, that year was Lance Stevenson and all that drama. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fun, man. It's, it's great. I, I always, you know, take pride in playing in big games and make sure I, I'm ready to play in big games and I show up for my team. Because uh, I just, you know, I like love to compete. I love to win, and uh, that's the main goal at the end of the day is trying to win the game and, and making sure you, you know you and your team are successful. So I, I always love playing on that big stage. You know, obviously, you know, you get nervous. At the beginning of the game, but once that ball goes up and you you know runs it down the court a, a few times and all those jitters go away. I see you wearing that WNBA sweatshirt now. Something I want to ask you about that league is what do they have to do to really take it to the next level to get more views? I see that young rookie Sabrina Inescu, I think that's how you say her name. People are really gravitating to her and some other stars in the league. So what is it that they need? Is it the players that need to become superstars and get people watching? I think I just think it's marketing. I think uh, a lot of people don't watch it because they think the game is slow, um, um, and it's just women playing. But I love basketball, regardless if women are playing or men are playing. I just want to see some good basketball, and that's why I support the league. I always want to uh, support them and uh, and make sure that I'm you know advocating for them and and, uh, and watching the games and and uh, supporting the players that I that I may know personally and just out there supporting ones that I that I may, I may not know, but. I love the game of basketball, whether it's women or men playing, and I think it's uh, all about marketing for the for the women. And I think the marketing will get there, you know, once all the the, the viewers come and the money comes in, all that kind of stuff. It's just a you know a trickle down effect. Mm-hmm. And your thoughts on the rumor? Well, not really rumor. People's idea that they should lower the rim to like nine feet, nine and a half feet, so more dunks and highlight plays could be there for the women. I want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, if you do that, then you're pretty much saying that women aren't, uh, you know, on the same level as men. So, I mean, uh, all the women, I'm sure, will feel full offended by that. And uh, I've had that conversation with people all the time. Uh, but I don't I don't think they should. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's fine where it's at. Like I said, just men just have to, not just men, but everyone just has to log in and tap in more and, and watch the game and support them. I mean, once they get the support, then the numbers will come up, all that kind of stuff will come up. So I think it's just about supporting the league and, and uh, just putting them, putting your money where your mouth is. <clears throat> the nickname of yours, Quiet Storm. How'd that come to be? When I first looked at it, I was thinking of the Mob Deep song. Is it from yeah. that or is it from something else? No, no. So uh, quick story. When my, I was 16, I was going to get my first tattoo. And uh, my sister, who lives in Nashville, uh, me and my brother go out to visit her every, every summer. And we were with her. And uh, we were not supposed to tell my parents we were getting a tattoo. And then we went to this, you know, this guy who gives tattoos for cheap for like $50 and we got this tattoo and I needed something to put over it. And, um, the, and one basketball guy. And, um, my sister was like, you know, why don't you use quiet storm? I was like, you're quiet, you're shy, but when you get on the court, your game uh, hits people like a storm. So that's kind of where it came from. And it's kind of stuck with me, you know, uh, throughout and just, uh, cause it's, you know, pretty much true. And, uh, it's kind of been with me ever since. I love it. And of course you attach quiet storm to the quiet storm foundation and also the three children's books you've written. Tell me about the foundation and the children's books that you wrote. 
Yeah, so when I was younger, I just wanted to be able to give back to kids. That was my whole goal. I said, if I ever can be successful of any, you know, uh, not suit, not basically a star or whatever, just wanted to give back to kids and and give them hope and give them uh, access and resources that I, I maybe they didn't have and uh, other kids in the, in the area didn't have. So we want to make sure we do that for kids. And we have several different projects and uh, events we have each year. We have a free basketball camp for kids coming up in July. We have a Black History essay contest that we do each year and we also fly the kids to DC for free. So just trying to give kids resources and access to, to different opportunities that they may or may not have and, and always just giving them hope and, and let them, letting them know that you can be successful no matter what neighborhood you come from, no matter the circumstances you live in. And for the books, um, uh, I just wanted to inspire kids. I, I thought I had some stories to tell to inspire kids to, to dream and um, let no one tell you that you can't do anything. There's plenty of people told me throughout my life that I couldn't make it to the NBA or I wasn't good enough, but I stuck to my dream. I kept working hard and eventually, you know, that dream came true. And you proved all that undrafted to overseas to the NBA. Something I want to ask you is what was the mentality of going undrafted and then almost like, oh, I didn't, I didn't make it. Now I got to go overseas. Was it a drag or you kind of saw it as a stepping stone to get to the league? A little of both. I had, you know, every emotion uh, going through draft night, being undrafted and having to go to make decisions to go to Italy. Uh, so I definitely, you know, thought about quitting basketball a few times. I always tell kids this, but um, my parents would let me give up on my dream or my goal. And they uh, they kind of saw the greatness in me when I sometimes didn't see it in myself. So um, they definitely, uh, you know, are big advocates and uh, are supporters of me. And, and they get all the credit, really, because if it was up to me, I probably would have quit playing basketball and went on to do something else. And probably we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> but uh, definitely, uh, you know, just basically just sticking to your dreams and goals. And like I said, not giving up and pursuing through all the ups and downs that you may, may have throughout whatever career you choose. Wow. And it all worked out, as you said, because we're having this conversation now. Right now, CJ, you're 37, still technically young enough to play in the NBA. Will we see CJ Watson back in the NBA? Or you're going to stick to balling out in the big three. Uh, yeah, I think my NBA days are over. Uh, I'm hung it up for now. Uh, I'm going to play in the big three again. So Got to work on getting back in shape and, and getting back in the gym. Uh, but I definitely think uh, the, the furthest I go is, is the big three for now, just to you know go out there and have some fun and play with old friends, old teammates, and uh, just you know seeing the guys in the locker rooms and things like that and just having fun again. It's been a long time since the last big three season due to COVID yeah. interrupting all that. What are you looking most forward to this season? Uh, just trying to get back and, and win it all. We uh, fortunately got to the championship last year. Um, we, didn't, we didn't win it. We lost in the championship game. And, but hopefully this year we can come back and, and bring that same type of noise and, and uh, win some games and make it back to the championship and this year win it all. Where can we find you on social media? Where can we find your foundation? And where could the fans buy your books before we close? Uh, you can find me You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, uh, quietstorm underscore 32. You can find my books at cjpens.com, cjpens.com. And foundation's website is quietstormfoundation.org. That's 10-year NBA veteran C.J. Watson. I'm Mikey Domagala, and that was episode 28 of Inside Buzz. C.J., I appreciate you coming on. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.